Hello, and welcome to our traditional service. We wanna thank you for worshiping with us here at Zion. And we also wanna thank you for your continued prayers and constant support. Would you join with us as we enter into a time of worship and a praise? Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us take a moment for silent reflection and self-examination. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. 
Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. Bend your ear to our prayers, Lord Christ, and come among us. By your gracious life and death for us, bring light into the darkness of our hearts and anoint us with your spirit. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson for today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, beginning with verse 14. For a long time I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp and pant. I will lay waste the mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn rivers into islands and dry up the pools. I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. But those who trust in idols, who say to images, you are our gods, will be turned back in utter shame. Hear, you deaf. Look, you blind, and see. Who is blind but my servant, and deaf like the messenger I send? Who is blind like the one in covenant with me, blind like the servant of the Lord? You have seen many things, but you pay no attention. Your ears are open, but you do not listen. It pleased the Lord for the sake of his righteousness to make his law great and glorious. Here ends the reading. Our psalm for today comes from Psalm 142. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint, before him I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. Our second lesson for today comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, beginning with verse 8. 
For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapter 9, beginning at the first verse. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begged, asking, and see him begging, asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know that he is our son, the parents answered, and we know that he was born blind, but how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue that was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. The second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his, his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this re they replied, <clears throat> you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out and 
when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and that those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. This is the gospel of the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'd like to begin reading today from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at, four, at verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, there, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 19. During these Sundays in Lent, of course, we've been looking at the crosses of Lent, our theme focusing on various types of crosses that symbolize, again, an aspect of Jesus' life or ministry or suffering and what that means for us today. And so we are here now at the fourth week. The first week was the Tau Cross, the Cross of Prophecy. The second week was the Saltier Cross, the Cross of Humility. The third week was the Anchor Cross, the Cross of Hope. And today is the Maltese Cross, the Cross of Regeneration. Well, this really is the time of year for regeneration, although I think winter is trying to hang on a little longer. This is typically the season now of regeneration as um, snow melts and as the leaves begin to explode from the trees and the plants begin coming up and the grass starts turning green. Regeneration means a change, a radical change, a rebirth, if you will. Spiritually speaking, it is God renewing our lives from spiritual death to spiritual life. It is our new life in Christ that um, is referred to in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, where it says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. It is being, another word, uh, a phrase for it is, it is being born again of the Spirit of God. And as a result, we begin to seek things that are of God. We begin to desire to become more like Christ. Our new life in Christ produces new attitudes and new actions pleasing to God. Uh, we might call them beatitudes. In fact, we have in the scriptures and in Matthew chapter 5, the beatitudes we have a different attitude about Christ. We, we as Christians have different values and, and those of course are, are um, uh, the biblical values that we, um, that we hold to. In fact, there are eight, talking about Beatitudes again, there are eight Beatitudes mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five. And as we look today at the cross of regeneration, the Maltese cross, as I have here, my, my drawing and my depiction of the Maltese cross, guess how many points there are on the Maltese cross? Well, there are, if you count them, there are eight. And these represent a regenerate life, the cross of regeneration, of new life. 
Going back to the Beatitudes, we're not going to look at each one of them, but I'll just mention them for us. The Beatitudes that are mentioned by Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 are these. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. These are descriptive of those whose lives have been changed by the Spirit of God. Those who have come to Christ, those who belong to Jesus Christ, have been born again, as we mentioned, through the Spirit of God. And now uh, they are able, or we are able, to bear good fruit. Because why? Because we are attached to the true vine. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And so as we are attached to Jesus, we can bear the kind of fruit, the kind of attitudes, the kind of actions that um, we are able to bear now that we are in Christ, that we have faith in Jesus Christ, who has given us the strength and the power to do so. We no longer seek just to please ourselves. Uh, we seek to please God. It's part of our, now it's part of our spiritual DNA where now we want to obey Christ, we want to serve him, we want to seek him versus um, apart from him where we do not uh, seek him, we do not desire to necessarily be in obedience to him. Paul wrote about it in this way in Galatians 2.20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In another uh, similar word, Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And then Peter wrote in uh, 1 Peter 3.18, these words, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. The righteous for the unrighteous. Jesus, of course, being the righteous one, we were the unrighteous one. And he died for us in order to bring us into that fellowship with God. Martin Luther wrote this quote, he said, this is the mystery of the riches of divine grace for sinners. For by a wonderful exchange, our sins are now not ours, but Christ's. And Christ's righteousness is not only Christ's, but ours as well. So we might ask the question, of course, how does that all, how could this all happen? We gave Christ our sin, um, which he paid for on the cross, which he willingly took upon himself. And in turn, he gave us his righteousness, which we could never pay for, never buy, or never ever deserve. And of course, we can call that God's grace and God's mercy. He allows us to have this gift uh, because of his love for us. In his book uh, entitled, He Chose the Nails, Max Lucado gives us a pretty good example of this biblical truth. And he describes an experience where he and his wife, Dinalyn, had a point uh, about uh, wearing a garment. And here's what he said. He said, we were, we were at this fancy restaurant, but the host, the maitre d', would not, ex would not change his mind. He didn't care that it was our honeymoon. It didn't matter to him that the evening was, that the evening at that classy restaurant was a wedding gift for us. He couldn't have cared less that Dinalyn and I had gone without lunch to save room for dinner. All of this was immaterial in comparison to the looming problem that I had and that was this, I wasn't wearing a jacket, which was required at this particular restaurant. I didn't know I needed one, Max said. I thought a sports shirt was sufficient. It was clean and tucked in. 
But Mr. Black Tie with the French accent was unimpressed. He seated everyone else. Mr. and Mrs. Debonair were given a table. Mr. and Mrs. Classier than you were seated. But Mr. and Mrs. didn't wear a jacket. If I had another option, I would not have begged, but I did not have an option. The hour was late. The other restaurants were either closed or booked, and we were hungry. I pleaded with the host, there's got to be something you can do, I said. He looked at me and let out a long sigh and puffed out his cheeks. All right, he said, let me see. He grunted, then he disappeared into a coat room and emerged with a jacket and he said, put this on. I did. The sleeves were much too short. The shoulders were too tight. The color was lime green. But I didn't complain. I had a jacket and we were taken to a table. Don't tell anyone, Max said, but I took it off when the food came. For all the inconvenience of the evening, we ended up with a great dinner and an even greater parable. I needed a jacket, but all I had was a prayer. The fellow was too kind to turn me away but too loyal to lower the standards, so the very one who required a jacket gave me a jacket, and we were given a table. End of story. And brothers and sisters in Christ, isn't that what happened at the cross for all of us? Jesus met the requirement of the Father, perfection and also a sacrifice. Seats at God's table are not available to the sloppy spiritual sloppy. Who among us is anything but spiritually sloppy? Unkept mor morality, untidy in truth, careless with people. Our moral clothing is in disarray. In fact, the Bible says our, our garments are nothing but filthy rags in comparison to what God requires. The standard for sitting at God's table is high, it requires perfection and holiness. And we can't, we cannot come up to that standard, but the love of God is higher than that. And he offers us something that we don't have. He offers us a gift. It is not a lime colored jacket, but he offers us a white robe, not a garment that is pulled out of a coat room, but a robe that is worn by his son, Jesus. It's a spiritual garment, mind you, not a physical one, but it's called a robe of righteousness. Scripture says little about the physical clothes that Jesus wore, but he certainly talks a lot about the robe of righteousness. One reference about Jesus' physical clothes is noted in John 19, beginning at verse 23 at the cross uh, is where this happened. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four squares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. And they said, let us not tear it, but let us decide by lot who will get it. End of, quote, end of the verse there. So why is it significant that this garment was seamless? Well, it can re represent for us completeness, a perfect garment. Scripture often describes our character, our behavior as like clothes that we wear. Put on the new self, which is righteousness and holiness. Put off the old self, which is, of course, unrighteousness. Ephesians 4 talks about it this way. Ephesians 4 verses 22 to 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That from Ephesians 4, the writing of Paul. Then Peter also urges us in his uh, epistle, to be clothed with humility. David spoke of evil people who clothe themselves with cursing. 
the character of Jesus is perfection, it's holiness, it's righteousness. And a seamless fabric woven from heaven to earth would be the picture that we might have. But when Jesus was nailed to the cross, he took off the robe of perfection of righteousness and assumed a different garment on our behalf. He became what we are, unrighteous, the garment of sin and shame and guilt, a filthy rag, as the Bible describes it, a torn, tattered, dirty rag he put on. Why did he do that? Why did he go that far for us? First Peter 2.24 says this, He, meaning Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. And so that clothing, the spiritual garment put on by Jesus was the sins of all of us, the sins of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus bore in his body our shame and guilt. Every aspect of the crucifixion, crucifixion was intended to shame the person as well as, of course, kill the person eventually. And it certainly did that. Normally, death on a cross was reserved for those who were vile offenders, those who were criminals, those who were um, thieves, those who were murderers, even slaves, assassins, and so forth. And what would happen would be that a condemned person who was to go and be crucified would be marched through the streets carrying his crossbar, the, the one piece of his cross, and at the execution site, it would be attached together, and the person would be stripped and being mocked and shamed and put upon a cross. And we know that Jesus was not only shamed before the people who were around him and the crowds that were crying out, crucify him. He was shamed even before heaven, before his heavenly father, so that he himself, when he took him upon himself our sin, cried out, at one point from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It, of course, the answer to that is because the holy God could not be in the presence of sin and Jesus had become sin for us at that point. He bore the sin of the murderer and the adulterer and he felt their shame. He never lied and yet he bore the disgrace of a liar. He had never cheated though he felt the embarrassment of being a cheater. And since Jesus bore the sin of the world, he felt the collective shame of the world heaped upon him at that point. He bore our sin and disgrace. And one of the scriptures that talks about that too compares the Old Testament sacrifice that the high priests would do to the bodies uh, and what they, what they would do to the bodies of the animal sacrifices uh, once they had uh, taken the blood from them and, and the way, of course, comparing that to the way that Jesus himself was crucified and gave his blood for us. From Hebrews 13, these words, Hebrews 13, 11 and following. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go outside the camp bearing the disgrace he bore. End of quote, Hebrews 13, 11 through 13. To be outside the camp meant to be unclean. In the days of the Exodus, there were those who were ceremonially unclean and had to stay outside the camp of the people. And Jesus suffered humiliation and spiritual uncleanness outside the city walls on on behalf of all of us, he laid down his life for you and for me. And the Maltese cross, again, is the symbol of that um, on the death of Jesus Christ and how he had exchanged his righteousness for our unrighteousness. He had done no wrong. He was not unclean. He was not guilty, we know, of course. The Bible said he had committed no sin. He did not, in other words, he did not deserve to be on that cross, he did not deserve to die, certainly. We did. And we are left with nothing but a plea 
to help us, Lord, save us. And that's exactly what Jesus does for us at the cross. But he, much, he goes much further than the maitre d' or the host in the story that Max told. Could you imagine a restaurant host removing his tuxedo coat and offering it to you? Even that does not come close to what Jesus did. Jesus does not give you an ill-fitted leftover jacket that looks ugly. He offers you and I a robe of seamless purity, of righteousness and perfection. He takes our coat of pride, our coat of greed, our coat of self-centeredness and exchanges it for another. He wore our sin so that we in turn could wear his righteousness. Galatians 3.13 says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Galatians 3.13. Again, we deserve the curse, but Jesus took it for us. He did not come to condemn the world, the Bible says, but to save the world. And although we come to the cross dressed in sin, we leave the cross dressed in a coat of his love, wearing a belt of goodness, clothed in garments of salvation. For you have clothed yourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 27. And so it wasn't enough for him just to prepare a feast for us. It wasn't enough for him to reserve us a seat at the table. It wasn't enough for him to cover the cost and provide the transportation to the banquet and all of this he does. But he did something much, much greater than that. He let you and I wear his clothes so that we could be properly dressed, replacing our unrighteousness for his robe of righteousness. He does that for you and me. That's how much he cares for us. And we have been given that robe. And today we're called again to that one particular cross, the cross of regeneration, the Maltese cross, that reminds us of this, that Jesus exchanges our old life for a new life. We are reborn. We are born again. We are changed. We are renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. The old has passed away. The new has come. Our sins are forgiven and the robe of righteousness has been given us. And our response to that certainly is, thank you, Lord. Praise be to you for your mighty gift of salvation and life anew in you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, what an honor it is for us to simply remember what you have accomplished for us. Not only did you take upon yourself our sin, but you also gave us a gift of of righteousness and holiness that uh, in and of ourselves, because of our sinful nature, we don't deserve nor do we have, but you by the power of the Holy Spirit have changed our lives. You have, you have given us new life, new birth in spiritually in you. And Lord, uh, we receive that with joy. What a wonderful gift you have for us. Our hearts are full. Our lives are full, for you have made it possible. And we are today thankful for all that you have done. Uh, continue, Lord, to lead and guide us. Help us to seek you continually and to, Lord, uh, seek the things that come from your mighty hand. For you indeed are holy and we, Lord, belong to you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in confessing our faith as we recite the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Mm -hmm.